welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, a.k.a. MMA Lock of the Night and your boy on social media at MMALOTN. This week, we're going over, I want to call it a big pay-per-view, but it's really about the main event. We got UFC 284 this weekend going down in Perth, Australia, headlined by a, ch- a true super fight, one of the best super fights and most legitimate super fights we've had in a very long time uh and it's going to be going down for the lightweight title we got champion islam mahachev hoping to defend his strap and move up in the pound for pound rankings against featherweight phenom alexander volkanovsky now i'm saying that this is the first true super fight in a long time because the ufc has done this thing where they continue to promote super fights that really aren't super fights right now, the one that comes to mind most recently was Israel Adesanya against Jan Bohovic when Adesanya tried moving up a weight class to secure that title. But the fact of the matter is, I believe that was Jan Bohovic's first title defense. And he had so many other guys that he could have gone through still to truly cement himself as the light heavyweight champion. And we obviously saw after he beat Izzy, he ended up losing the title to Glover Teixeira. So that's what I mean. The, the last time that I truly felt that the two best guys in the game were going head-to-head was probably way back against uh, with uh, John Jones against Daniel Cormier. I believe that was UFC 182 or UFC 183, but it was a long time ago. And that was the last time I felt like we were seeing two guys at the top of their game in the prime of their career as well going up against each other. And now we're getting it this weekend. This is a big, big, big time fight with Alexander Volkanovsky, who's been beating everybody in the featherweight division left and right. And although that this is Islam Mahachev's first title defense, I believe everybody around that top five to top 10 of the lightweight division right now doesn't really have a good enough case to be getting a title shot, nor would they give much of a threat to Mahachev to begin with. We still need time for these lightweight contenders like Rafael Faziev and Arman Surukin to build their way back up to getting a title fight. So I'm not really sold on Islam defending it against anybody other than Volkanovsky who's looking to come up add a second title to his mantle and truly cement himself as the number one pound for pound fighter and possibly the GOAT. You know what I mean? We have to start giving him respect and start to think about this guy potentially being one of the greatest fighters of all time. So uh yeah very much looking forward to this fight and then obviously in the co-main event uh the interim title for alexander volkanovsky's title uh, is going to be going down this will likely dictate who gets the next crack at volkanovsky uh and that's going to be going between going down between yair rodriguez and josh emmett a fight that i wasn't really excited about first but now after running the research and doing the tape i'm very much excited for it so should be a good fight uh and then the rest of the main card it's kind of meh you know what i mean a lot of oceanic fights filling out the rest of the card a couple fun fights sprinkled throughout but in terms of name value and really selling this card it's up to that main event it's up to that super fight which i really don't think is getting the respect it deserves nor the attention from the mma casuals that it should hopefully they're able to tune in and see what kind of high level fight that's actually going to end up being before I continue on with the podcast, I do want to obviously quickly plug the Patreon link in the descri- description below. You guys get access to all the best bets and props and predictions for the upcoming UFC and Bellator events. But not to mention, I've obviously have my regional MMA tier where I go over the PFL, PFL Challenger Series, uh, LFA, CFFC, Cage Warriors, and Fury FC. A ton of content that I'm shacking out every single week, every single day over there. So every Everybody's getting a, a lot of bang for their buck on that uh, service, so make sure you guys check it out. And in regards to my YouTube channel, you know, I mean, I've only been doing the MMA Logcast, obviously, and I'm looking to add a little bit more content to it, so keep your eyes peeled for the content that's going to be dropping throughout this week. A couple fun things that I want to start adding to it and, and getting you guys involved with, and just looking forward to seeing how you guys react to some of the content that I'm going to be dropping but in regards to the last week, you know, my, my return to the content space, doing amazing numbers. You know, I, I've topped the, the last 10 videos that I dropped other than that one, uh, you know, the the one video in regards to talking about the, the past situation, but it topped pretty much all the numbers from December, November, October. Uh, so it's great to see the amount of support that's still out there. Truly appreciate everybody that's been watching the videos, dropping a like, dropping a comment, showing the support and showing that I can still come back strong in this content creation game. And hopefully we're able to keep those numbers up and keep that support coming 
forever grateful and thankful for every single one of you guys with a positive uh with the positive support and uh showcasing it to the world that you guys are still there for me and i greatly appreciate that all right enough with the sob shit enough with the the sentimental stuff let's get into what you guys are here for and that's the breakdowns for this ufc 284 card so without further ado let's get started at the bottom of the card and it is a featherweight belt between 25 and 1 zubera tuhugov welcoming short notice newcomer 13 and 3 elvis brenner very intriguing fight here starting off on the Tuhugov side this guy is somebody that I haven't really been high on uh historically speaking you know i mean he's been in the ufc since 2013 coming up on nine years of being with the promotion but this is only his 10th fight he hasn't really been that active inside the cage only having about one fight per year and he didn't even get to fight all of last year Although he did have a fight scheduled in October, I believe for UFC 280, uh, he was forced to pull out of that fight because he botched his weight cut and was pulled out, I believe, on, on weigh-in day. So he didn't compete in all of 2022. Obviously, in 2021, he picked up a big win over Hikaru Hamosh in, you know, a, a little bit of a back-and-forth fight, although Tuhugov was the one pushing the pressure the entire way, utilizing his big overhand right that he likes to rely on quite often, and then getting it into the grappling in clinch rums whenever he feel co feels comfortable or feels as though he needs to just pull away with the fight he's 5-2-1 since joining the roster in 2014 I still don't know if he's really you know a guy that's going to make it into that top 10 to top 15 of the UFC's light or featherweight division I should say uh, he, he's always been Khabib's lesser skilled training partner that Khabib always brings along with him right I like to to kind of uh, um Compare him to the Artem Lobov to Conor McGregor, the Chris Avila to Nate Diaz, or the Marcos Mariano to Anderson Silva, for anybody that gets those references. Uh, he's done a good enough job in terms of remaining relevant, or somewhat relevant, at least staying in the UFC for as long as he has, but I think he has somewhat of a limited skill set that's only going to take him so far. Um, one of the stats that I kind of put out to people uh, in the lead up to his last fight against Ricardo Hamos is in his five fights that have gone to a decision, uh, at least one judge has scored the fight against him uh, or scored the third round against him, showcasing that he's really not reliable when fights go deep in fight or deeper into the rounds or deeper into the waters. And the same st stood true in the Ricardo Hamos fight. So now you can count it as six fights where in the third round, uh, judges have scored against Zubera Tuhuga and although he's done enough work in the first two rounds to get his hand raised it still is of note that he does start to slow down as fights start to go late but he relies on his overhand right and he relies on his grappling and his clinch game to really pull away from fights and get his hand raised via decision more often than not moving on to his short notice opponent here who trains out of the same training camp as Charles Dobronx Oliveira at least for the last two years or so uh, Elvis Brenner has a well, he, he lists himself as a BJJ practitioner, but more often than not, you see him going out there and utilizing a striking skill set. He likes to utilize kicks and likes to really use an aggressive style to try to put the pressure on his opponents with that kicking game. And the only issue is, at times he finds himself on his back where opponents are able to eat at him uh, with control time and just grind him out from that position. There's a fight that he had about three or four fights ago against a Russian fighter where he was really teeing off on him and having good success in the striking realm, but he just made small mistakes that caused him to end up on his back, allowing the Russian fighter to just grind him out and end up winning that fight via decision. Like he just had that fight within his grasp, but just was unable to get it done. In his next matchup against Gabriel Santos, who is now the LFA champion over there, we saw uh, it be relatively competitive through the first two rounds, but in the third round, he found himself on his back and Santos was able to grind him out, win that fight via decision. Now, Brenner's riding a two-fight winning streak, which earned him this short notice spot in the UFC, but that a competition that he was going up against in that two fights was very abysmal. He was just absolutely smashing these guys. Those guys did not even deserve to be in the cage with Brenner, and I know that we're going to get a steep step up in competition here for Brenner now that he's making his UFC debut. I'm always looking for reasons to fade Zubera to Huga, but this is not the spot, even with his opponent being a plus 400 underdog. We can see Brenner likely having some success in the striking round, putting his output to use and his kicks to use, but 
I think that hard nose striking style of Tuhugov is going to be able to crash the pocket, land those big strikes on Brenner, possibly finishing him in the early goings of this fight. But I think that this will likely go the full 15 minutes where we see Tuhugov implement a wrestling game when he needs to to really keep Brenner static and control this fight for the large portions of the 15 minutes. But I do think that hard nose striking style of Tuhugov is going to pay off for him here, which will allow him to land the big shots, but also close that distance to get in on the hips of Brenner, drag him to the ground, and grind him out. Brenner might not have a lot of success at this UFC level, but I still expect to him, you know, if they give him the lower level of this featherweight division, he might be able to scrape out a couple wins, but at his present a product or the present form that he's in right now i don't really see much of a high ceiling for him or a reason to really back him in many fights at least you know depending on what it looks like stylistically speaking when he faces future opponents but in this specific matchup i'm not high on to who got that minus 600 i think this fight is a pass all in all but in terms of a prediction i think we'll see to who got grind this out over the full 15 minute mark and pick up a decision victory in uh, his first fight back in what is it, two years? Well, I'd say a year and a half now since the last time we saw him in competition. So official prediction to Hugov by decision. There we go. Next up, we got another featherweight belt on hand here and we got American Blake Builder making his UFC debut fresh off of getting that con uh, contract off the contender series he comes in with a 7-0-1-1 record and he's taking on uh, returning Shane Young who comes in with a 13-6 record Starting off on the Blake Builder side of things, like I said, he earned his spot on the UFC roster with a win on the Contender Series, pulling off an upset as a plus 180 underdog against Alex Morgan. In that fight, a lot of people thought that Blake would get knocked out as even though Blake has a flawless 7 one record, he has been hurt in a lot of his fights, but has managed to build himself back and get the wins within those fights as well. But a lot of people thought Alex Morgan's knockout power would translate to the contender series. Unfortunately, Blake was the one that ended up rocking Alex Morgan, getting him to the ground, grabbing his back, and eventually sinking, sinking in that rear naked choke. Blake, at his best, is able to get opponents to the ground, grind them out from that top position, either finding a finish by ground and pound or eventually opening up a submission opportunity for himself to be able to get his hand raised. He's entering the UFC at an age of 32 where most fighters are usually in their prime and Blake is one of those guys that got a late start to the MMA game so it's really now or never in terms of him getting these quality wins because this is the peak of his career and the time is really ticking against him considering like I said he's 32 he's going to be 33 this year as well and in this division you have to be ready to go especially when you're at that age. I think that he's going to be taking a legitimate step up in competition here going up against Shane Young and I'm just not sure if his striking game is really up to par to be dealing with these fighters that are much better than him technically speaking in the striking room. He will obviously be able to stay safe when he's able to drag fights to the ground but how how effective can he be with that especially with fighting this level of competition i'm expecting to see a better version of him uh, obviously on a fight to fight basis but as he starts making these improvements uh, and this progress, he's obviously going to be fighting stiffer and stiffer competition now that he's under the UFC banner. On the flip side, we got Shane Young, who's returning after a nearly two-year-long layoff, and he's looking to halt a two-fight losing streak uh, and getting the night started with a win for one of the guy uh, down-under representatives. Young is obviously a very st slick striker who utilizes output and his movement to really keep his opponents on the defensive and outstrike them from that distance range that he likes. He's not a big hitter, but he can more often not really technically outwork his opponent opening up finishing opportunities with his speed and his precision that's usually how he's able to put his opponents away he hasn't really cited the reason as to why he's been relatively inactive over the last little while uh he's alluded to some demons that he's been dealing with but still a bit of a big a bit of a question mark in terms of why he hasn't been uh as active as he would like to be over the last two years he's a city kickboxing product and based on his instagram he's getting in work with those usual suspects with the city kickboxing crew but he also looks to be in phenomenal physical condition so i'm very much looking forward to seeing if he's able to recapture some of the success that he had earlier in his ufc career now being with uh 
again, he's always been with the city kickboxing guys, but now making his return to the UFC as well. A part of me is, you know, wanting to play pick Blake Builder because of him being able to cash as an underdog for me, a plus 180 underdog at that in his contender series fight against Alex Morgan. But I do think he's going to struggle to keep Shane Young down here. And I think on the striking side of things, I think we'll see a much more effective approach from the Shane Young side. And I think that I could actually uh, give us a, a finishing opportunity for Shane Young. Shane obviously wants to put a stamp on his return to the UFC and I think the way that he matches up with Blake Builder here will allow him to be effective in that and eventually find that knockout blow. I think his movement mixed with his improving takedown defense will allow for those openings to show themselves which he'll be able to emphasize on with his reach, with his speed and with his length Length, and I just don't think that Blake Builder is ready for that step up in competition especially with the level of striker that he's going up against here. So I, I do like the Shane Young side here. I do think that he's a good spot to go out there and get a win, even a knockout victory, and unfortunately start Blake Builder's UFC career off on a loss. So official prediction, I'm going to go Shane Young being the smoother, crisper striker, showcasing good get-ups and good takedown defense to eventually open up that knockout opportunity. And I think it probably comes, let's say, second round knockout victory for Shane Young. Next up, we got a pair of women's straw weights going up against each other here where we got Loma Lukbunmi coming in with a 7-3 and three record going up against Elise Reed, who comes in with a 6-2 and two record. Now, I've largely been very impressed with the improvements that we've been seeing from Loma Lukbunmi over her UFC career, and I think that we're seeing a solid... Uh, evolution from her in terms of her grappling game obviously she came into the UFC mainly as a Muay Thai practitioner but you can see the work that she's been doing with her head coach George Hickman originally from Tiger Muay Thai now at Bangtown Muay Thai showcasing that the grappling side of her game is very much improving she's been showing off takedowns of her own but even in grappling situations she's show, showcasing a lot of patience and discipline allowing her to even stay calm in those bad positions that she might find herself in even in some close submission opportunities from her opponents but she stays calm she sticks to the basics and she eventually gets out of those bad positions get back gets back to the striking realm where she's vicious with her leg kicks vicious with her combinations especially elbow and we're even seeing takedowns from her now where she's able to get some good top control from her opponents or against her opponents but she Ill, she is showing a little bit of rawness in certain situations which allows her opponents to end up pulling off reversals pulling off submission attempts but it's good to see her like i said sticking with the basics remaining calm in those bad situations and then getting back out of them I, I like the progression that she's at but she's always going to be at a disadvantage in terms of her size she would benefit from an atom weight division a 105 pound division but since the ufc does not have that she's going to have to eventually grow into this body of hers putting on a little bit more muscle getting a little bit more strength so that she can deal with the bigger women of this division but just based on her progression with her grappling realm i do think that she could be successful in the ufc at the strawweight division if she continues improving at the rate that she is at but i love her striking i love her leg kicks i love how brutal she is when she gets into the clinch realm especially with her elbows and i think she's going to be a very difficult puzzle for a lot of fighters to solve especially as she continues to round out her full mma game on the flip side with elise reed this is another fighter that's been making solid improvements since making her ufc debut obviously she got really stifled by Sajara Eubanks in her UFC debut who Sajara much better than her in the grappling realm and jiu-jitsu realm and we saw it play out pretty easily for her but Elise has been able to pull off an upset victory in two of her three UFC fights so far obviously the Corey McKenna fight she was able to keep that fight upright and utilize her taekwondo to really butcher McKenna from distance and beat her to the punch eventually winning that fight via decision obviously she got grinded out by Sam Hughes who's a much better wrestler than her much better grappler and we saw Sam get a solid victory there but Reed pulled off another upset victory in her last fight against Melissa Martinez, who a lot of people were high on going into that fight, but Elise used her taekwondo, used her ability to traverse the outer, uh, you know, the outside of the range of her opponent and blitzing her whenever she needed to with that straight down the middle, usually coming with a lot of power and really frustrating and hurting her opponents. She's showcasing good development in her defensive grappling, where she's able to keep fights upright, but also work back to her feet if she is taken down and 
And you can see how strong she is, especially when she's jockeying in these positions up against the cage against her opponents. So that's obviously a positive that she's going to have throughout her career. But when she's at her best, she's able to utilize her footwork and really just stifle her opponents with her distance striking, crashing the pocket with her Taekwondo entries and using that straight right or straight left down the middle, whatever is going to be her cross, depending on which stance she's in. Because she doesn't mind switching stances when she needs to, as she is very comfortable from both stances, if that's what's required of her. In this matchup, I'm kind of surprised that the line is as wide as it, as it is. It seems like people are still not giving Elise Reed the respect that she deserves. However, I do think that if this fight does play out in the striking realm, Elise might have some success with her blitzing attacks and utilizing that range management the way that she does. But I think that we'll see some solid leg kicks from Loma Luke with me to slow down those Taekwondo blitzes from Elise Reed. And I wouldn't even be surprised if we see Loma attempt to try to drag this fight into the grappling realm and try to control Elise from on top my one hold up which is why i'm not so hot on this chalky line on the loma lupunmi side is the strength advantage that i think that elise reed's gonna have in this matchup right obviously technically speaking loma lupunmi could still get this fight to the ground but when they are jockeying for position in that clinch game elise reed's strength might come into play here kind of stifling whatever loma is going to be looking to do from that uh clinch position Obviously, Loma could get to her tie, plum, clinch, uh, submit, uh, um, uh, position where she can unleash some nasty elbows and some nasty knees. But I do think that we'll see Elise really try to use those double underhooks to try to stifle that type of approach from Loma. But I think as this fight starts to go on, we'll see Loma start to really dictate the pace from the outside, using her leg kicks to slow down Elise Reed and then start to open up with the rest of her game after that. So I do lean Loma in this fight. I do think she wins this fight, but I don't have a tremendous amount of confidence in it because Elise Reed is, you know, the, the underdog that continues to bark when people don't expect her to. And I do think that the, the vast majority of the public is a little bit higher on Loma Lupin Me than they are on Elise Reed, which is why we're seeing the line the way that it is. But I still do think that Loma will come out on top, not worth the chalk, but she should win this fight. And I think she outstrikes Elise Reed on her way to a decision victory. Next up, we're going to be going back to the men's featherweight division where we have Jack Jenkins, who's coming in with a 10-2 and record, going up against Don Sheenus, who's coming in with a 12-4 and record. Jack Jenkins earned his spot on the UFC roster with a win on a on the contender series, a dominant victory over his opponent where he was able to ground him time and time again, slice him up with elbows from on top, and then eventually beat him via ground and pound in that third round where he just kept the pressure on, kept the relentless relentlessness going and it just wasn't uh you know in the cards for his opponent to get his hand raised th that night jack jenkins is a slick striker who throws in solid combinations but he does his best work when he's able to implement his grappling game get the fight to the ground and just crush his opponents from that top top position he does a good job in terms of posturing up at opportune moments to rain down those big shots and try to damage his opponent get them out of there by ground and pound but he also does a good job in terms of maintaining that top pressure and doing a good job of uh, really just putting the hurting on his opponent with his his grappling he has really good cardio as well to implement the same style and pressure from minute one to minute 15 in fights and we can see that obviously in his contender series fight but throughout his or regional career as well he doesn't train with a big team or anything like that but he's been managing to make it work for him and he seems to have the skill set to be very successful at the ufc level even with a small gym so I I, th I think there is a you know a very good case that Jack Jenkins is you know going to be one of those one of those special talents to come from the oceanic realm that could be making a run for the title in the next year maybe two years as he starts taking steady steps up in competition and the, his opponent this weekend I think is a good step up for him a good step in the right direction to keep taking harder and harder fights to truly showcase that he is a very special talent now speaking of his opponent Don Shane Shane came in on short notice against Sodiq Yusuf several months back where he came up short ended up getting finished 30 seconds into that fight 
I gave Sheamus a lot of credit from what I was able to gather from his regional scene where he showcased uh, a very heavy grappling game where he's able to get opponents to the ground, grind them out from that top position, either finish them by TKO from on top, find a submission, whatever it might be. His striking game kind of limited to a calf kicking game. He doesn't very much do much else other than that. He likes to kick the legs, stay active enough on the feet with pitter patter shots, but he eventually closes the distance, drags the fight to the ground and just grinds his opponent out. He looked very active uh, from what I saw, even when taken down, looking for reversals or getting back to his feet, if he was the one getting taken down. But I think a lot of his success came from the fact that he was just fighting a lower level of competition. Uh, you know, he can be a regional champion, of which he was, you know, he was a, a champion in two different divisions on the regional scene before making the jump to the UFC. But I think a lot of his success came and and the reason why I was thinking so highly of him came against lower levels of competition. Yeah, he beat, you know, Cody Fister on the regional scene. And I gave him a little bit more credit than he probably deserved for that win. But he showcased a lot of good things throughout his regional run. But I just don't know if it's going to cut it at this level as we obviously saw him get squashed by Sadiq Yusuf in his UFC debut. Now he's going up against a more complete opponent, in my opinion, in Jack Jenkins, who is going to make it very tough for him. So, yeah, I don't know. Sheamus, he has good grit. He has good determination. He has good heart. But I think at this level, he's just going to continue to get out techniques, outworked by these much better featherweights. And I just don't know how much longer we'll see Sheamus on the UFC scene. Now, in terms of how these guys match up with each other, uh, kind of what I said with Jack Jenkins and his last opponent was that, you know, Jack and his opponent were good at the same things, but Jack was just much better than him at those things. And I think that the same can be said here. However, I do think that Jack is the better striker of the two here. Uh, I do think the majority of this fight will be taking place in that grappling scenario and those grappling situations and although Don has shown some good reversals and get-ups on the regional scene I don't know if he'll be able to cut it against a guy like Jack who's just so crushing with his top pressure when he does get those takedowns um, again in the striking realm I think he's the much better fighter and if Jack can just stay steer clear of those calf kicks from Don he should be able to open up those uh, striking combinations for himself but ultimately that takedown where he's just so good when he gets these guys on the ground I feel very damn good about Jack in this spot. You know, I think he's more than deserving of the chalky price that he's at. And it could honestly be said that he probably deserves to be an even bigger favorite going into this matchup because of the skill difference in this in this fight. So look for a very bright future and a bright career from Jack Jenkins as he starts to move on through his UFC career. But look for him to have an emphatic uh, win here against a guy like Don. He might not be able to finish Don, but I think it will be a dominant fight from the first bell to the last bell. I'm going to officially predict Jack to win this fight via decision. It wouldn't surprise me if he ends up getting a finish, but I do think that uh, Don is going to be a little bit difficult to put away. Jack doesn't really have the power, nor the, the I don't want to say he doesn't have the strength of Sadiq Yusuf, but he doesn't really have the power to put on the hurting the way that Sadiq was able to in the clinch and eventually wrapping up that guillotine choke. But I'm expecting a grinding pace here from Jack where there's very little success from the Don Shana's side. Official prediction, Jack Jenkins via decision. Next up, we're going to be going up a division here to the men's lightweight division where we got 15 and 5 Jamie Malarkey looking to get a victory over short notice Argentinian newcomer Francisco Prado. Now, Jamie Malarkey, he's coming off a victory, I believe, over his, uh, yeah, a victory in his last fight against Michael Johnson, a very close fight, a fight that likely could have gone either way. A lot of people scoring that fight from Michael Johnson, but uh, a good heart, good determination showed from Jamie. Uh, he hurt uh, Michael Johnson before, sorry, Michael Johnson hurt him first in the first round, and, and Jamie was able to hurt him back uh, uh, in the same round, finishing off that uh, round with the momentum in his favor, won that second round with superior striking and landing some good damage, and Michael Johnson ended up winning that third round, coming back, showing his resilience, but still 
uh, enough judges thought that Jamie Malarkey deserved the first round, obviously won the second round, and he took home the decision victory that night. He was scheduled to fight Magomed Mustafa back in October. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Jamie was forced to pull out, not really citing an exact reason as to why, but now here he is making his return to the cage after being out of the cage for over seven months now. He was originally scheduled to fight Nazrat Hakpras, but Hakpras forced to pull out. Prado steps in, a much better and easier fight for Jamie Malarkey for Jamie to showcase you know his his overall skill set you know I didn't really have high hopes for him when we saw him in his UFC debut against Brad Riddell but that was a back and forth crazy war where both guys had tremendous success but it was ultimately Brad Riddell who was able to get his hand raised there Malarkey is a, a gritty fighter with good durability and uses his length to just strike for his opponents from the outside with straight shots down the middle. He loves dragging his opponents into wars and really, you know, sometimes has his own troubles like he did in the Michael Johnson fight and how he had in the uh, Jalen Turner fight. But he really does thrive when he's able to get those guys, uh, lesser opponents, into those types of fights where he's able to get his hand raised. Wrestling really isn't the gist of his game, but he has a good enough grappling game to drag the fight to the mat whenever he needs to to get his hand raised. Cardio is another strong suit in Malarkey's game that he's able to weaponize and really just force his opponents to, to work harder than they're expecting to. I think that Malarkey is very much rounding out his game very well throughout his six UFC fights and he's been having an up and down career thus far through the UFC but he's really carved out a spot for himself where he can still go out there be competitive against most of this division but he probably won't ever be in title contention if I'm being honest. He's still only 28 years old and I do expect him to be continuously improving throughout his career and the fact that he's aligned himself with guys like Alexander Volkanovsky, Brad Riddell and even BJJ standout Craig Jones, it's safe to say that he's going to continuously be improving throughout his MMA career and we might even see new wrinkles throughout his, uh, throughout his career, especially this weekend against a young UFC newcomer in Francisco Prado. Speaking of Prado, he comes in with a flawless 11-0 record, uh, 11-0 record, sorry, uh, coming in on short notice, replacing Nazrat Hakprast. Uh, he's a very athletic fighter with solid power, especially when he explodes into his punches. He just received his black belt in Taekwondo a couple weeks ago, but he showcases a very solid striking game even without... Uh, having to credential himself with that black belt. Uh, he still seems a little green, though, to be taking such a significant step up in competition, making it to the UFC so early in his career, I do, I do think it will be detrimental. He hasn't really been facing the best competition on the regional scene. And although he, you know, he's 11 and 0, a lot of his victories have been coming from the fact that he is very athletically um, gifted. And that's usually the advantage that he has in his fights. He throws a lot of kicks and uh, he throws a lot of heat into his uh, punches as well. And he has a decent enough understanding of the BJJ game where if he is put on his back, you do see him attacking with submissions, although maybe not with the best uh, technique. And he's been able to, uh, you know, catch a couple of guys in some submissions. I just don't know how effective it will be at this level in the UFC. He throws some flashy strikes and he likes trying to seek that knockout. But again, I, I do believe the vast majority of su his success on the regional scene has just become has been coming from his physical traits and his physical attributes. I do think we'll see him struggle in his first couple performances in the UFC. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be a big wake-up call for him that he still has a lot of things to, to fix in the technical aspects of his game if he wants to be successful at this level. He's a fun prospect, but I just do think I, I think he's biting off a little bit more than he can chew by jumping in on short notice like he is here. Jamie Malarkey, I do think we'll see him pick up his second straight victory here. And I do think that he's a very bad matchup for Francisco Prado, who's likely going to be looking to unload the clip early in this matchup. And yes, he will be dangerous because Jamie Malarkey can be hit. But I do think that we'll see Malarkey evade those big shots. I think we'll see Mal Malarkey look to get his grappling going to try to keep Prado static, try to stay away and nullify that big knockout power of Prado. And as this fight starts to drag on, probably by the 6th or 7th minute, I think we'll see Prado really start to huff and puff, allowing Malarkey to take over this fight with his striking, with his grappling, with an overall MMA game, and eventually finishing Francisco Prado. It could potentially come in the second round. It could potentially come in the third round. But that round one is going to be a little sweaty, if I'm not going to lie. You know what I mean? I do think that Prado will have the 
the the speed advantage and that could cause malarkey some issues in the early going of this fight but if malarkey can see the shots coming if he can evade them get this into the grappling realm start chipping away and and sucking that energy dry of prado i think we'll see malarkey really start to pull away with this late and eventually finish it in the third round so official prediction jamie malarkey round three tko or submission either or let's just call it inside the distance next up we go down to the men's flyweight division where we have Brazilian Clayton Rodriguez taking on 13 and 6 Shannon Ross. Now both guys came from the contender series. Clayton Rodriguez earned his uh, uh, chance on the UFC roster by beating Santo Curatolo on the contender series where he showcased a very diverse kicking game where he was able to keep his opponent at distance and really dictate the pace of that fight. When we saw him make his UFC debut against CJ Vergara, we saw what happens when he is faced with somebody that's actually presenting some resistance. Obviously, the early goings of that fight was very much competitive, but as it started to go on, we saw Vergara's pace and pressure and eventual takedowns really start to break Clayton, and we saw Clayton huffing and puffing in that third round, and Vergara was able to just walk through the kicking game of Clayton, really put the pressure on him with uh, combination striking and a, a clinch game and even some takedowns when he needed it. Clayton can be broken and I think that's kind of been the big issue in his game is that he will struggle when guys can walk through those those fast and uh, powerful kicks that he throws early but it's easy to break a kicker especially when you're able to keep them on their back foot. Clayton is having so much success on the contender series because his opponent had no idea how to break that pressure, how to break that forward uh, movement. And that's why Clayton was able to just stay on distance, fight at his pace, really not exert too much energy and have to, to gas out. He didn't have gas out at all in that fight because he was able to dictate the pace of that. That was not the case in the Vergara fight, which is why he ended up coming up short in that matchup. On the flip side, for Shannon Ross, Shannon Ross, even though taking a loss on the contender series to Venetia Salvador, he showed enough heart, grit, and determination that the UFC still decided to give him a contract. He is a solid fighter who does a lot of good work by really engaging in the clinch with his opponents, grinding on them, breaking away, getting back to work with his hands, and then putting them back in the same position. If he can get the takedown, he's a good job of he does a good job of utilizing his top pressure and getting off solid damage from on top, but he does a good job of crashing the pocket and getting off some big shots with his uh, power striking when he is in the striking realm. Uh, he's 33 years old right now, so he's really got to get it going. And I just don't know if that he has the full tool set to be very competitive at the top of this division, but he will still be a very hard out for a lot of opponents that are going to try to up, pull off the upset or or get a, a victory off of him shannon uh, you know there's a there's a lot that can be said about his game in terms of things that he can improve on but you gotta admire his derm determination and his grit in terms of crashing crashing the pocket especially when he's usually the shorter fighter with the lesser reach than his than his opponent in this matchup against Clayton Rodriguez, Shannon Ross is very much going to have to take on the game plan that CJ Vergara implemented to get his hand raised. Crash the pocket, look to evade that big kicking game of Clayton, and maybe even get some grappling going of his own to start to slow down Clayton, who we know could have cardio issues depending on the pace that's put on him. I don't see Shannon as being one of those guys that's going to be shy in terms of staying on the outside, similar to uh, Santo Curatolo on the contender series for a Rodriguez. Uh, and I think that's going to allow Shannon to have some success here. My big question mark is his durability. Now, I think the difference between Vinicius Salvador and Clayton Rodriguez is that Vinicius is actually pretty good with his hands and has some good power with his hands, whereas Clayton not as comfortable throwing his hands, much prefers the kicking game. And I think with Shannon, you know, having a little bit of, uh, he's going to have some difficulties in the early going of this fight. But if he can stay conscious, I think the deeper that this fight goes, his forward pressure, his big punching combinations are really going to start to get to Clayton. And I think that's going to allow for Ross to take over the later that this fight goes i think ross has some good value as an underdog in this matchup especially if he can stay conscious like i said that's a big holdup for me which is why i don't have a lot of confidence on the uh shannon ross side but i do think that uh we can depend on him to crash that pocket and really keep clayton rodriguez on his heels which will allow this fight to get easier and easier for shannon as this fight goes into deep waters 
So my prediction is going to be Shannon. And I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up getting a finish late in this matchup. But my official prediction is for him to win this fight via decision after a very tough first round. I think we see him start to bite back, really start to fight back and pull the momentum back into his side and take over the longer that this fight goes. Give me Shannon Ross by decision, pulling off the upset over Clayton Rodriguez. In the next matchup, we go back up to the featherweight division. A lot of featherweight fights on this card. We're going to be talking about 10-1-1 Joshua Kulibau going up against the gun, Melsik Bagdazarian, who comes in with the 7-1 record. Now, Joshua Kulibau came in on short notice back in 2020 against Jalen Turner, had a, you know, made a decent account of, of himself in that first round, as a lot of people expected Turner to squash him right off the bat. Ultimately, Turner did finish him in the second round. But since that fight, Joshua Kulibau has gone 2 0 and 1, and there's a good enough case that he likely should have won that fight that went to a draw, and this could have been 3 and 0 over his uh, last three fights. But we do have that draw sprinkled in there that he had against Charles Jourdain. He pulled off the upset as a near 2-1 to one favorite, or sorry, 2-1 to one underdog in his last fight against Sung Woo Choi, where he put on solid pace, solid pressure, and actually outstruck the Korean fighter, who a lot of people expected to be the uh, far superior striker if they were to battle it out in that realm. But Kuli Bao utilized solid pressure, solid output, and just kept Sung Woo Choi on his back foot, allowing, allowing Kuli Bao's durability to show off, his pressure striking to show off, and eventually his great gas tank to fuel that all to get his hand raised in his matchup. He has showcased solid takedown defense, which allows him to keep this fight in the striking realm where he feels most comfortable. And he really frustrates his opponents with that forward pressure that he continues to bring. He has a good mix of pressure striking, uh, sorry, pressure and striking, which allows him to be so successful. And I think that's why he was able to hurt Choi so often because Choi was not expecting to be pressured as much as he did. Choi uh, did manage to get some late grappling going in that matchup, but Kulibao did a good job in terms of defending. And uh, even though he looks like a very deceiving fighter just by looking at him, he's very tough to break and he's going to be a very difficult opponent for a lot of fighters to beat. They might be technically better than him, but Kulibao does a great job of utilizing all aspects of MMA with his pressure to get his hand raised more often than not. Keep an eye on him. On the flip side, for Melsic Magdazarian, he came into the UFC with a big win over Dennis Bazukia. Excuse me, uh, on the contender series. Uh, going into that fight, though, Melsic Magdazarian was on a four fight winning streak. He had lost his first ever professional MMA fight took some time off, did his thing in the kickboxing realm, eventually came back to MMA, and it took him a combined 60 seconds to dispose of those four opponents that he faced before he went on to the contender series. He starched every single one of them with big power, and the big question mark for him going into that contender series fight was, does he have the cardio to go a full 15 minutes if he needs to? He had a great first round against Dennis by really landing his big power shots and combinations and just stalking him. We saw him start to slow down in that second round where Dennis was able to regain some respect and some confidence, but Melsic got his second win in that third round and really put the pace and pressure on uh, Dennis uh, once again, really landing big shots, getting into the clinch position, landing big knees, ultimately winning that fight via decision and proving a lot of people wrong that he could actually go a full 15 minutes if he needs to. He disposed of Colin Anglin in his second UFC fight by finishing him in the second round by showcasing good patience and discipline. And I think that's a large part of the reason why he's been so successful to this point. He's realized that it's not going to be so easy like it was in his for those first four wins that he got in the MMA world, finishing guys in six, seven seconds, seven seconds and 30 seconds. Um, and I think that will lead to a lot of positive experiences for him in the UFC. Even though the Bruno Souza fight was fought at a bit of a pedestrian pace, with Souza just being a little bit too more, uh, too much, uh, with leaning on his bicycle and and movement from the outside, Melsuk was still able to cut off the cage every now and then, land some big combinations, and ultimately win that fight by decision. But he very wasn't really pushed too much in that fight, and that was kind of my big holdup as to you know like. It's good to see the discipline and patience that Melsic is showcasing, but what does he do against a guy that's going to be really pushing the pace against him? And will he still be able to keep up that same level of success against the guy that's going to be pushing it uh, uh, on him? 
but I do think that there is a, a you know a higher ceiling for Meltzik than I originally thought off of his contender series fight and I'm you know I'm not thinking he's as much of a glass cannon as I originally thought of him now in regards to this matchup like I just alluded to uh, Joshua Kulibao is going to be pressuring Meltzik here and I'm very much curious to see how Meltzik will look to deal with it I do ultimately think that Melzik will be dealing with that pressure by just throwing his power shots and really trying to get Kulibao to respect that power that's going to be coming back his way. I think after Melzik hits him a couple of times and stuns him a couple of times, I don't know how willing Joshua is going to be in terms of crashing the pocket the way that he normally does. And although he had success against Choi, I think he's going to be dealing with a much heavier hitter and a much faster striker and Melzik, which will likely demoralize Kulibao the longer that this fight goes. But I still can say for certain that Melsic will be able to have that success the longer that this fight goes, considering we've never really seen him fight that. We saw him catch a second win, like I said, against Dennis Bazukia, but Kulibao is a far superior opponent than what he fought against Dennis. I do think, though, that Kulibao is going to walk himself into getting knocked out in the early goings of this fight, and we're likely not going to be able to see Melsic deal with that pressure the later that this fight goes, because we won't have an opportunity to. We'll see Melsic land that big shot, put Kulibao out early in this fight, and the train continues on for Melsic for being that heavy hitter that he is. And a lot of people are still going to be looking to fade him moving forward, but uh, I think if he can continue this discipline, stay within himself, keep, keep his feet underneath him, and just stick to what's good for him, throwing power combinations, being disciplined with it, being patient with him, those knockouts will eventually come or he'll just go out there and continue to outstrike his opponents just as he did in his last matchup against Bruno Souza, just as he did against Dennis Bazukia, or he could produce knockouts like he did against Colin Anglin and likely the way that he's going to against Joshua Koulibaly this weekend. So I get why the line is as close as it is. A lot of people were mystified thinking that Melsic should have been a bigger favorite, but I will give Koulibaly the respect that he deserves. I won't have a whole lot of confidence on the Bagdazarian side, but I do think that we'll see Melsic get that knockout, get that win, and it likely comes early, probably in the first round. Next up, the prelim headliner. We got Tyson Pedro coming in with a 9-3 record. He's going up against the returning Modestus Bukowskis, who comes in with a 13-5 record. Tyson Pedro has largely been inactive over the last three and a half years, but he managed to rattle off two quick victories in 2022. But let's not get ahead of ourselves as the odds makers dropped him as a minus 1,000 favorite when this fight initially was announced. Obviously, the public betting that fight way down to now Tyson Pedro being around minus 230. Let's be fair, though, because Tyson Pedro disposed of Ike Villanueva and Harry Hunsucker, two guys who have really proven that they are not at all UFC caliber. So I would not get too far ahead of myself thinking that Tyson Pedro is going to start achieving that potential that many expected from him when he made his UFC debut back in 2016. This is still a guy that lost to, uh, sorry, uh, that gassed out and got knocked out or TKO'd by Shogun Hua in 2018. Shogun's one of my favorite fighters, fighters of all time, but he has not been himself at all since maybe 2013 or 2014. So to get finished by a 2018 version of Shogun Hua raises a lot of question marks for me, honestly speaking. Tyson was mainly known for his crafty ground game, but as of late has been sticking to his striking, which has led to those two dominant victories over his last two fights. Again, we gotta bring into perspective what kind of threat Villanueva and Hansucker actually provided to him. I still believe that people are higher on Pedro than they should be, and I still have a lot of question marks about him, but... Hopefully he continues to prove me wrong because he's a fun fighter. He has a fun personality. He's a great character within the game, but he needs to showcase more to me inside the cage before I can really get behind continuing to back him as a chalky favorite in his matchups. Modestus Pukowskis dropped three out of his four fights in the UFC and ultimately got caught after that vicious injury that he suffered at the hands of Khalil Roundtree. Obviously, the UFC was able to take care of Modestus Pukowskis, but still cut him uh, and forced him to go back to the cage warrior scene where he initially made his come up and Bukowskis was able to rattle off two wins including winning the light heavyweight title for cage warriors and eventually stamped himself uh, another spot and another chance at the big show in the UFC. 
Lukowskis is a solid striker. He's a big guy for this division. He's going to be standing at six foot three, just as his opponent Tyson Pedro this weekend. And I think he actually has the better technical striking as well. His ground game is still a little bit of a question mark as a lot of opponents really haven't had success in terms of dragging him into that realm. That's kind of my big question mark here is how well will his defensive uh, grappling play against the guy that will likely be taking this fight into the grappling realms. Bukowskis is still only 29, or at least he'll be turning 29 the day before this fight, and he was very competitive in his matchup against Mihal Oleg Shejak, a fight that many believe that he deserved to win that decision. That fight alone showcases that it can deal with a guy with the pressure striking of a Mihal Oleg Shejak and be very competitive, land his own shots, hurt his opponent as well, and have some success and, and be competitive at this high level. He got completely smashed by Khalil Roundtree, who was very aggressive, something that I'm not expecting from his opponent this weekend, which should allow Bukowskis to be very good from that outside range and have his own success. I don't know how far Bukowskis will make it in the UFC's light heavyweight division, but I do think he can remain competitive with the middle of this division, maybe that top 15 to top 10 range, but I'm not writing him off. Again, he's only 29 years old or will be 29, like I said, and he could still make some improvements and really, you know, achieve much higher than that top 10 potential that I believe he will be capped at. Now, again, I, I really do believe that the odds makers screwed the pooch by putting Tyson Pedro at minus 1,000. And now there's a lot of people out there with plus 600 tickets on Modestus Bukowski who are just laughing their way all the way to the bank because I think they could potentially cash that ticket. Again, Tyson Pedro has been finishing uh, Ike Villanueva with calf kicks. He uh, crumpled Harry Hunsucker with a kick to the body. I'd be surprised if he's able to catch Bukowskis with either one of those types of finishes. And then if they are uh, tasked with going strike for strike and being seeing who's the better technical striker, I believe Bukowskis is the better technical striker of the two. I do think that we'll see Pedro look to get this fight to the ground, but I've never really been impressed with his ability to get fights to the ground. He hasn't showcased a good enough wrestling game to me in the past, and I think he might struggle to do the same thing here to Bukowskis. So I think you're getting a damn good price tag on probably the better fighter here in Bukowskis, but a lot of people don't want to see that because they saw or they see Bukowskis on a, or will go one in three in his four fights in his initial run in the UFC and not give him the respect that he deserves. And then they see Tyson Pedro going out there and getting these emphatic dominant victories, but not putting into perspective how low level those, those opponents were. And even Bukowskis, the level of competition he's going up against in uh, the last two fights that he had on the Cage Warrior scene, not the greatest, but still showcasing that he has a good striking game and can be very competitive even at a higher level when he makes it back to the UFC, which is what he has done this weekend. So not a whole lot of confidence. My my one qualm is the potential durability issue of Bukowskis. Maybe Pedro is able to get this into the grappling realm, but I think where the odds stand, Bukowskis is a very good play and a very good spot to try to take advantage of. And again, Tyson just has so much more to prove still. And the same could be said about Bukowskis, but I think that Bukowskis has the tools to pull off the victory this weekend. And it might be a finish. It might be a decision. I think for the sake of this podcast, I'll go Bukowskis via decision. Uh, but yeah, do not at all attach yourself to that Tyson Pedro truck. Even if he wins emphatically this weekend, I don't think he deserves to be this big of a favorite just because of the recency bias that's being put on his day. So give me Bukowskis, Bukowskis by decision, and a valiant and triumphant return for the, the what's his nickname? The Galtic Warrior? Let me just, Alfred, see? Barking dog, the Baltic gladiator, Udustus Bukowskis, getting a victory in his UFC ah. return. Next up, we got light heavyweights going at it here with Jimmy Crute with a 12 and 3 record going up against Alonzo Menafield with a 13 and 3 record. Jimmy Crute is currently riding a two fight losing streak, and it seems as though Crute has made some very big life changes, and it seems to have reignited the fire to come back with a better overall game. Usually when fighters say that, I, I don't really believe them, right? Like they, they kind of just always say that to try to get people to believe that they're going to come back a better fighter. But there's something about Jimmy Crute this time around that makes me believe him. He looks in phenomenal shape and he's been getting in very solid work with guys like Robert Whitaker and uh, Rob Wilkinson. And we already know how good his jujitsu game can be, but he's been making very good improvements with the striking game. 
He stays very active with his kicks, and I think that's going to be a big part of his game plan this weekend. And I still think he could use some work with his wrestling game to help complement his high-level high level Brazilian jiu-jitsu game. But I'm very intrigued to see what kind of improvements he's made and if his wrestling has improved during that time. I'm willing to give him a pass on a couple of the losses that he's taken, right? Obviously, the the Anthony Smith fight didn't really work out in his favor due to his leg and ankle giving out on him. And then I thought he just was a little bit too lackadaisical against uh, Jamal Hill, and he quickly play, paid for that. I do believe that uh, we'll see a different version of Crude here. I think we'll see a much better version of him, especially with him only being 26 years old. We can expect solid improvements from him uh, every fight out. The, the, the best part of his game, and even though he's so good at jiu-jitsu, the thing that I like the most about his game is his kicking game because he's just so persistent with it. And it's a great way to just stay on the outside and stay away from big power punchers by just staying on that kicking game from the outside where your opponent can't catch you. Obviously, it didn't work out against Jamal Hill, but I thought it was a lot to do more so with him just not giving Jamal Hill the respect that he deserved and knowing that Jamal could likely put him down with one shot just the way that he did. On the flip side for Alonzo Menafield, Menafield's looking to get a three-fight winning streak going on. Uh, and, you know, he's been looking very good, especially with finishing his last two opponents in the first round. We know what Alonzo Menafield's all about, though, right? He, he wants to put his big power out there, and he wants to deca- decapitate his opponents with his big strikes. It looks like he's trying to work on his ground game by finishing some of his fights on the ground recently, especially with that Von Flu choke that he was able to get Fabio Charant with, the elbows from the crucifix position that he got Moserov out of there with. But I still think he's going to be that guy that just eventually wants to knock you out. I don't think he'll ever get a good enough wrestling game or good enough cardio to uh, to pursue a wrestling game, which would make him uh, effective in that spot. I you know, I, I love his coach. Safe Sayud is a great general in uh, in the corner of a fighter and has really been making improvements to a lot of fighters. But I just don't know if Menafield's ceiling will be higher than being that guy just, just goes out there and tries to knock you out. He'll always be at the mercy of his hard-hitting style and his lack of cardio and ability to carry that through a full 15 minutes if he needs to, which will allow opponents like um, Ovin St. Pru and, and other guys who have been able to just pick him apart from distance and stay away from his big striking game. I, I do think that he can improve a little bit. And even though his uh, takedown defense shows 85%, there's not a lot of fighters that have showcased a solid amount of control time over him when they're able to get him to the ground. I still just can't get over his how much he slows down later in fights. And I think that a lot of fighters will be able to take advantage of that. This weekend, I think Jimmy Crew will do a really good job of just keeping his kicks going from the outside, slowing down Alonzo Mellowfield when they're able to get into the clinch position. I wouldn't be surprised if Crew does manage to land a takedown or two, but Mellowfield has been a very difficult opponent to hold down. And even though Crew may be one of the better BJJ players that Mellowfield has gone up against as of late, I still don't think that Crew will have a lot of success in terms of holding him down. I think we're going to see Crew just... Try to utilize output, movement, and his cardio against Alonzo Manifield here to just outpoint him, touch him up, and then eventually take home a decision victory, uh, stamping a triumphant return, especially after going on a two-fight losing streak the way that Jimmy Crute has. So look for a triumphant return, like I said, from Jimmy Crute. Output, volume, movement, and cardio. That's the name of the game for Jimmy Crute here, and I think he wins this fight via decision. Next up... Main, uh, sorry, we are. This is going to be the second fight on the main card. We got heavyweights going at it. Five and three, Justin Toffa going up against thirteen and seven, Parker Porter. Very intriguing matchup here. Starting off on the Toffa side, who comes from a kickboxing background. He is an Aussie who throws nothing but big power in his shots. He throws in decent combinations, but his lack of footwork really deters how successful he could actually be. He has a 2-3 and three record inside the UFC with his most recent victory coming over Harry Hunsucker. But as we all know, just the way that I touched upon uh, Harry Hunsucker and the Tyson Pedro knock, uh, breakdown, not much to really take from that matchup. It took him less than two minutes to get Hunsucker out of there, showcasing just how big his knockout power can really be. Tafa didn't compete at all in 2022, citing that he had a lot of injuries that he de- was dealing with, but 
he seemed very secretive and cryptic about what those injuries were, never really alluding to exactly what they were, which leads me to believe that maybe they could be very detrimental to the rest of his career. He's only 29 years old, so I'm not expecting him to have like a bad hip or anything like that. But maybe some knee injuries or knee surgeries could really deter him from implementing his power punching style that a lot of people have known him to, to, to showcase. He's also had a child during his time off, and he said he's really much enjoying his time off to be that father, but I just don't know how effective he'll be on upon his return and what those injuries will have done for his career moving forward. Again, his lack of footwork just causes him to just stalk his opponents, and his opponents have been able to pivot out of bad situations and just double or triple him up on strikes. The Jared Vandera fight is the one that sticks out to me the most because I expected Vandera to have success in that fight by taking the fight to the ground. But he didn't. He just stood there with Tafa and danced around him and landed the better strikes, ultimately outpointing him, winning a decision. And I think that's something that a lot of opponents can get away with. On the flip side with Parker Porter, we got a heavyweight that is still relatively competitive, even though he's 38 years old. Obviously, we saw him go out there and get starched by Chris Dawkins in his UFC debut, but to the surprise of many, was able to put together a three-fight winning streak after that with wins over Josh Parisian, Chase Sherman, and I'm trying to rack my brain for the last one. I can't believe I forgot it off the top of my head, but Parker Porter was able to defeat Alan Baudot. Yes, that was the fight where I expected it to finish under two and a half rounds, but that fight went the full 15. But we've seen a good mix of Mark martial arts from the Parker Porter side he has a sneaky wrestling game some good jujitsu as well where he really likes attacking the Kimura but he throws in solid combinations and has good durability on the feet that he could take some shots from his opponent just to go out there and dish out his own game he has good footwork as well in terms of being able to stay mobile and really confusing his opponents and then using kicks using his combination boxing after that as well to really rack up the numbers and the output I like what I see from Parker Porter even at 38 years old and he could still be competitive against a lot of the middling heavyweights, the Chase Shermans and the uh, Josh Parisians of the world. I think those are the types of guys that he beats. Luckily for Parker Porter, this weekend he fights one of those middling heavyweights and although Justin Toffa has a tremendous amount of knockout power, I think we could see this fight play out similar to the Jared Vandera fight for Justin Toffa where Jared just outpoints Toffa from distance. Now, I don't think Parker is as agile and as mobile as Jared Vandera, which brings into the equation the takedown opportunity for Parker Porter. Now, Justin shows a 100% takedown defense rate, but I'm not completely sold on that considering he's only faced two takedowns and the two guys that we expected to, to take Justin Toffa to the ground didn't even attempt a single takedown. Juan Adams, who was knocked out a little bit early, and then Jared Vandera, who was more than comfortable without pointing Justin Toffa on the feet, neither one of them shot a single takedown. I'm expecting Parker to switch this game completely up, throw some combinations, stay mobile, and then when the time is right, look to get this fight to the ground and control Justin Toffa from that top position. I am very scared of Justin Toffa's knockout power, don't get me wrong, but I still think that this is a spot where Parker Porter can go out there and do what he does best, mix the martial arts as effortlessly as he does, and put together a solid body of work over 15 minutes and win a decision victory. Next up, we got welterweights going at it here and a bright prospect on display taking a st steady step up in competition firstly we got randy brown coming in at 16 and 4 on the flip side for jack della madalena he comes in with a 13 and 2 record now brown has been paying his dues for plenty of years now in the ufc and is putting together a four fight winning streak at this time and uh this is probably the biggest spot of his career to date third fight from the top on a pay-per-view card against a bright prospect and Jack Della Maddalena Brown is hoping to utilize his lanky striking approach with his combinations to fluster Jack and go on to win a decision victory he's pretty solid in the clinch when he can get his knees going and he's done a very good job in terms of developing a grappling game to help keep fights in the striking realm where he does his best work and where he is obviously most comfortable He's fought a couple power punches over his last couple fights, but he's done a very good job of nullifying the majority of their threat. 
His movement allows him to just be so free-flowing with the striking from distance as he does a good job of just staying on the outer reaches of his opponent's danger zone, allowing him to just kick from the outside and use his lengthy striking to keep them at that distance and keep them at bay. It's clear he's in his prime right now and he has a sky high amount of confidence which should be allow him, allow him to be even more effective in the cage. I think he will eventually start to feel some of the, the pressures of the technique and the skill set of the top of this division, especially as he starts ascending this welterweight division. And I really think with the amount of great wrestlers that are littered throughout the top of this division, it's going to keep Randy Brown from truly achieving the potential he expects of himself, which is welterweight champion. On the flip side with Jack Dell and Madalena, it seems like we really have a special talent on our hands here. Madalena's ability to use his combination striking and big power really has skyrocketed him in a lot of UFC fans' eyes, which is why he is such a big favorite over a tested and true veteran like Randy Brown. His defensive grappling has done very well thus far. He's found himself in some precarious positions, but his discipline and his patience has allowed him to get out of those bad positions and get back to his handiwork where he's done so well. He's just so disciplined and so composed. And even in his striking approach, he doesn't just focus on the head. He does a very good job of digging to the body when he needs to. And he's a very rare uh, situation or he's a very rare um, fighter in the aspects of not just throwing combinations, but throwing five, six, seven punch combinations and mixing up the target every single time. So he never, his opponents never really know where he's going to be throwing next. So they don't know whether they keep a high guard or whether they keep a low guard. And whenever, whenever they make that wrong decision, that's when Jack is able to dig to either the head or to the body with a very significant blow that ultimately makes them, uh, probably finishes them. He was the first ever fighter to finish Ramazan Amiv in the UFC with a beautiful body shot and he did the exact same thing to Danny Roberts in his next fight. It's going to be interesting to see how he deals with opponents that look to put an aggressive wrestling style on him. As I said earlier, the top of this division is pretty much littered with guys that want to take you to the ground and grind you out. But it seems like the UFC is matching him up the way that he needs to ascend to the top of this division without facing a lot of that wrestling threat that many people fear will be his downfall. And again, he's only 26 years old. This guy has a tremendous amount of potential. And the skill set that he's already showed to this point in the UFC leads me to believe that he will have a very bright future in this promotion. And he'll be a very exciting uh, fighter for the Oceanic region to get behind. And this could be one of his coming out parties by defeating a guy like Randy Brown on this stage as well. So I am very excited to see Jack try to perform against this style of Randy Brown trying to break through that range that Randy's going to be fighting at. But I think with the long combinations that Jack Della Maddalena throws, that will allow him to get on in the inside and really put to work his combination striking and that power eventually finding that chin of Randy Brown and putting him out in this fight. I could see why people might want to get on the veteran side here with Randy Brown, considering how effective he is with fighting at distance and utilizing output and utilizing his knees when opponents get too close. But I just don't think he's ready for the type of pressure and methodical striking style that's going to be coming from Jack, which is why I think Jack will close that distance without too much issue, get off his strikes, and eventually find that knockout and put Randy Brown out probably within the first 10 minutes of this fight. So I am on board with people taking the chalk on Jack in this spot. He doesn't have the experience to back up that chalk price, but I do think he has the potential and will continue to achieve that potential as his career goes on, just as he will this weekend by knocking out Randy Brown. Let's call it round two, Jack Del Madalena by knockout. Next up is the first of two title fights that we have on the line. And in this one, we got the interim featherweight title on the line with 14 and 3 Yair Rodriguez going up against 18 and 2 Josh Emmett. Yair Rodriguez has found himself in a title fight off of a TKO via injury victory in his last fight over Brian Ortega. It was a relatively competitive matchup early until uh, I believe it was a dislocated shoulder or a broken shoulder, whatever it might have been for Brian Ortega, which caused that fight to be to 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 stop. Uh, the fight before that, Yair Rodriguez put up a much better fight than many expected when he went to a decision against Max Holloway. He ended up losing that fight, but still showcased that he can compete at a very high level. 
We know what to expect from Yair Rodriguez. He utilizes a very crafty striking style, an unorthodox striking style from distance where he utilizes a lot of kicks, tries to keep his opponents at distance, and he uses his movement very well to just stay on the outside and just pretty much where he likes to operate by utilizing his kicks and his striking from distance and then blitzing the pocket whenever he wants to open up and throw some more strikes. He's developed a recent, uh, a decent grappling game which allows him to keep fights upright but even mixes in takedowns when he needs to where he feels like he can just eat out, eat up some time from the clock and get back to his combination striking and outworking his opponent on the feet. <clears throat> He's decent with his output, but I do think that, you know, he does start to slow down later in fights as we've seen opponents really start to take over later in fights, just as Jeremy Stevens did in their second meeting. And Yair Rodriguez, not a big hitter by any means, but he does a very good job in terms of lulling some opponents into a uh, a trap of some sort where he's able to unleash a devastating head kick or strike of some po- sort if you're not careful enough to put you out. He's only 30 years old, so there's still a lot of growing for him to do and a lot of skills for him to learn. And I get why they put him in a title fight here, but I just don't know if it's going to be enough to surmount the uh, the threat that he has here in Josh Emmett. Josh Emmett, on the other side, has become a dark horse in the division and has quietly put together a very solid winning streak. His five straight wins, the last of which came over Calvin Cater in a back-and-forth main event in June. And some people thought Cater deserved to win the fight. But a lot of people thought that the power-striking style of Josh Emmett was more effective than what Calvin Cater was trying to do by throwing more strikes in that matchup. There's nothing that seems like a setup shot or a soft shot from the Josh Emmett side who throws nothing but heat and power in everything that he throws. But he throws... In combinations, he throws in numbers. He doesn't just do what you would expect an archetype of his fighter to do, which is just throw an overhand looping uh, strike, try to find the chin, and just rinse and repeat, and then slow down as time goes on. He found some sort of cheat code because he's able to do that, throw in bunches, not just throw one or two pot shots, but also do it over 25 minutes if that's what's required of him. He has great... um, uh, he has great cardio. Uh, his grappling is off, obviously up to snuff. He has a collegiate wrestling background, not the highest of levels, but enough for him to be competitive against other wrestlers in this division. But he likes to go out there and swing those hammers, swing those sledgehammers that he has and try to knock his opponents out. Even if he doesn't knock them out, he just stays persistent enough to keep landing on his opponents. He does a great job in terms of countering every time his opponents throws so that he can shell up enough to nullify whatever attack is coming his way and then blitz into his counter strikes which allow him to add up the damage on his opponents if he's not able to knock them out. Again, he's not really a guy that many suspected to be a title contender but here he is one fight away from achieving gold around his waist and I think that it's absolutely possible considering the matchup that he has ahead of him. Yaya Rodriguez is a a tremendous talent, don't get me wrong, but I think that for him to be effective, he's going to have to be the one that's setting the pace. And as we saw in his fight against Jeremy Stevens, he could do it in the early goings of fights, but as the power and pace starts to catch up to him of his opponent, he starts to slow down, and that's where opponents are, are able to take over. Josh Emmett has 25 minutes to establish his game here, and although the first 10 minutes of this fight will be maybe competitive, maybe in the Yaya Rodriguez's uh, realm I think that Josh Emmett will get closer and closer with those big punches and it's going to continue to demoralize Yaya Rodriguez and I think just slowly but surely Josh Emmett is going to get closer and closer to eventually finishing Yaya Rodriguez probably in the fourth or fifth round of this matchup I could see Yaya trying to get some clinch going some wrestling going but Josh has good enough defensive capabilities in those realm Uh, in those realms to keep this fight upright and to keep on that style that he has just been so reliant on and so successful with which is power punching forward movement countering off of any strike that his opponent throws and landing those big bombs of his own in those long combinations that he throws them with so look for this fight to be competitive early but i expect josh Emmett to take over as this goes late and i think he'll deliver on a knockout probably in the fourth or fifth round of this fight and new interim champion of the featherweight division, Josh Emmett.
All right, let's get to the main event of the evening. But before I do, I always like to plug the Patreon and always love to plug the hit that like and subscribe below if you haven't already. Obviously, like I said, I got a ton of interesting content dropping throughout this week on the YouTube alone. But obviously on the Patreon, you can expect breakdowns for Bellator, UFC, Contender Series, CFFC, LFA, Cage Warriors, Fury FC, all of that good stuff on the Patreon. Link in the description below. We got LFA this weekend and PFL Challenger Series, both, which will be covered on the Patreon as well. So if you want to get prediction on those or predictions on those, Patreon, that's it. That's all I got to ask. <laughs> all right, let's get into this main event fight. Lightweight title on the line, pound for pound, number one on the line. And a good case for either guy to be in the GOAT conversation with the wind this weekend. We got lightweight champion Islam Ahachev coming in with a 23-1 record. He goes up against 25-1 featherweight champion Alexander Volkanovsky. Now let's start off with the Islam Ahachev side here who obviously comes in as the favorite. And honestly, I wish I sacked up and made him my lock of the night play against Charles Oliveira last time around. But even a guy like me who has been around the game for as long as I have sometimes gets sucked up into the hype and recency bias of a fighter like Charles Oliveira who looked relatively unstoppable during the run that he was on until he eventually ran into Mahachev. But I knew for sure that that Dagestani wrestling was going to be able to overcome the offensive nature of that or offensive style of Charles Oliveira with his Brazilian jiu-jitsu and that striking style that Charles was really starting to get a groove in. Mahachev was able to take him to the ground, pass his guard, smash him into submission, and then eventually get that, I believe it was arm triangle choke, to get him out of there. Mahachev is a phenomenal fighter, phenomenal wrestler, and he's getting better every time out as well. Uh, his wrestling is probably one of the best that we've seen maybe since Khabib. Um, his striking is definitely getting better than what Khabib's level was as well. And he's really starting to get that respect that a lot of people thought he deserved over the last couple of years. Now that he finally has gold around his waist that he achieved back in October, now is his time to cement his legacy by going out there and defending it time and time again. Maybe even one day moving up to 170 pounds to try to get that strap as well. I don't think he'd go down to 145. I think that cut would be too much for him. Maybe 170 would be next. But let's not look past his opponent here and Alexander Volkanovsky, who I've been on, uh, who I've been high on for a very long time. Uh, and he continues to prove why he is a number one or the number one pound for pound ranked fighter. It's going on 10 years since he's been undefeated over his last 22 fights. The funny thing about his game is that he's not a magician or a uh, completely amazing at one thing in the MMA game, but he is a master at putting all those things together in the cage and being such a, a great overall fighter. From his grappling to his striking to executing, executing a game plan to perfection, it's been very difficult for opponents to try to thwart whatever he's been trying to do. There might have been guys that have won a round or two away from him, but he's always done a great job of adjusting on the fly, getting back into the groove, and then getting back to what has made him successful in all of his fights. He has a good striking game, and he has an even better defensive grappling game. And even though he has, I believe it was a 76% defense rate in, in uh, his takedown defense, no opponent has been able to hold him down for large amounts of time. He does a very good job of getting back to his feet, getting back into a position to work back to his feet, and I think that could be a large part of this matchup against Islam Mahachev. I like everything that Volkanovsky does. He is very strong. He's very quick. His cardio is off the chain. He is very good at, like I said, every aspect of MMA and even better at blending it all together. Now in this matchup, a lot of people think that the Dagestani wrestling is going to come through and believe that Makachev will be able to grind out Volkanovski. And that's a big concern for me if I'm going to be looking to go on the Volkanovski side. Sure, the, the, the strength and the size of Makachev will play a factor in this matchup, especially when you have such a good wrestler like Makachev. But I think that Volkanovski is strong enough and I think he has done a good enough job in terms of bulking up to try to make up for that extra 10 pounds that he'll likely be at a disadvantage of. And I think that we'll see it translate pretty well. 
But I think that a large part of this fight will be controlled by Makachev in those clinch situations and possibly those grappling situations. I'd be surprised if we see Makachev get more than two minutes of control time on the ground. Now against the cage, of course, he'll probably be able to control maybe seven, eight, nine minutes of this fight in those situations. But I think that we'll see eventually that Volkanovski is going to be able to break away and get back to a probably a, comp uh, a complex striking game that Makachev is going to have some issues with. Whether it starts with a kicking game like he did against Max Holloway and, and Joe Jose Aldo or following up with big strikes and teasing that uppercut anytime Makachev wants to change levels, I think he could keep Makachev at bay and I think that his cardio will allow him to fuel that over 25 minutes and who knows, maybe Makachev starts to slow down the later that this fight goes trying to keep Volkanovski down who's going to be almost impossible to hold down. Again, the big concern for me here is the size difference but I think that Volkanovski is good enough that he could be damn good at plus 300. The fact that we're getting the number one pound for pound fighter, a fighter who has been undefeated in 22 professional mixed martial arts fights over 10 years, that you can get him at plus 300 is absolutely crazy to me. This fight should be closer on the odds in my opinion. And I do think that a lot of people are looking at the close submission attempts that Brian Ortega was able to get on Volkanovski as a reason that Makachev is going to be the one that completes those submissions. But what we know about Brian T. City as, you know, as mediocre or above average of a fighter as he is, he's very dangerous with his jujitsu. Makachev is not as risky of a jujitsu jiu practitioner. Ortega will throw up any and everything and he'll try to and he's very good at locking up a lot of those whereas Makachev needs to grind himself into a position to open up those submission opportunities and I'd be surprised if he can do that over and over again uh, again here against a guy like Volkanovsky who he's going to have trouble keeping on the mat so I'm going to go for it I, I might be in the majority or minority here but I'm going to go with Volkanovsky as my prediction I think as long as he can continue to get back to his feet and get back to work with the damage that he's going to be able to inflict in the striking realm, Makachev is going to start to, I think he's going to start to slow down. Like I, I, I do think with the amount that he's going to be grappling and unsuccessfully holding Volkanovski down, it's going to start to slow him down and Volkanovski should be able to start to take over the later that this fight goes. Last thing I want to say, the level of competition that Makachev has been going up against compared to the steep Step up, he's taking here in uh, Alexander Volkanovsky. It cannot be overlooked. Volkanovsky would more than likely smoke most of the competition. If Actually, no, he would smoke all of the competition that Makachev has faced on his way to the title. I have no doubt about that. I think people are just putting so much stock into Charles Oliveira's rise, which is warranted. Look what he was able to do. But I think that top of the lightweight division are guys that are past their prime, but still have that name value that keeps them relevant. The Justin Gaethje's, the Michael Chandler's, the Conor McGregor's, uh, the Dustin Poirier's. Yes, those guys are all great fighters, but I don't think they're at the level of Volkanovski, nor is Charles Oliveira. So I think people are overlooking that step up in competition that Makachev is taking here, and they're completely overlooking Volkanovski's chances in this matchup. I'm going Volkanovski and new champ champ, Alexander Volkanovsky winning this fight via decision. I love it. Oh, also over two and a half around that minus 175 range. I do believe this is going to be a long, drawn out battle. This will likely go all five rounds. So if you can't pick a side, I think taking the over two and a half is probably, probably the safest way to approach this fight. But I think there is a tremendous amount of value on who I think is probably the best fighter on the planet right now, Alexander Volkanovsky. And that's a wrap on the breakdowns. Appreciate everybody checking out the episode. As always, again, we topped almost all the numbers with the last episode, which was just a shitty fight night card. Let's see if we can do it once again with this big pay-per-view card or at least this big super fight pay-per-view card that we have. Appreciate all the positive support. Appreciate everybody checking out the show as always. And again, keep your eyes peeled for a couple other things dropping on Thursday and Friday of this week that has to do with this pay-per-view card, but uh, something different that I'm trying to, to see where it goes. So make sure you guys keep your eyes peeled for that. All right. Again, Patreon, uh, PFL Challenger Series breakdowns will be on there. LFA breakdowns will be on there as well. Link in the description below. Check it out. Appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Catch you again next week. Peace out. And I'll see you guys next week when Volkanovski is champ champ. Later.